Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Inner Wisdom webinar. Thank you for joining. Uh, so my name is Robin Lee, and I'm the CTO and co-founder at Inner Wisdom. Uh, Inner Wisdom was founded with a, one simple goal, really, which is to give our customers the ability to exploit every aspect of their data with artificial intelligence. Um, and so fundamentally, we're about artificial intelligence and machine learning on public cloud and specifically using Amazon Web Services. So um, today we'll be spending 30 minutes, just short of 30 minutes, going through uh, through the, the subject of AI, the ultimate tool to maximize the value and impact of your data. Uh, so if you've got any questions as we go along, if you just type them in the GoToMeeting app box and um, we'll take questions at the end um, and uh, you know, any, using any time we have left and um, any questions we don't get to, we'll pick up and come back to you offline. So um, without further ado, let's, uh, let's dig into this exciting topic. So, so what I'm going to go through, just a quick, uh, quick agenda for you, is I'll, I'll, I'll do a little discussion on what's changed. So how, how is the world different to maybe how it was five to 10 years ago? So why is artificial intelligence now a, uh, really kind of in a game changing phase? Then I'll dig into what the opportunity is for organizations. So um, at different different layers and what the kind of use cases are that we commonly see. And as I go through that, I'll dig into some examples of uh, artificial intelligence in action and sort of bring it to life with some specific uh, examples out of that set of use cases. Then I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what some of the barriers are for organizations to adopt artificial intelligence and to give some strategies and tactics to overcoming those barriers that we've learned as we've uh, gone through a number of customer um, customer projects so from our experience uh, and just give you some some tools uh, to help you tackle those and then, and then as I said we'll pick up a couple of questions uh, if we have time at the end and then I'll wrap up and, and close so without any further ado let's dive in so first what has changed well uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that's got a very long history so say, let's say back to the 70s um, but it's really accelerated massively in the last, say, three to four years. Um, so, so there's a number of factors at play there. So the, the first one is just that simply the, the volume of data, the scale of data and the speed at which it's being generated. Um, and it's so a lot of the artificial intelligence algorithms and machine learning algorithms perform much better the more data they have. And so the, so the increase in volume of data has also led to a, an increase in predictive accuracy. Um, so there's a huge amount of data to, to chew on and to learn from and to build machine learning algorithms against. The, the second point is, and I guess so there's a symbiosis here, the sophistication of AI techniques and algorithms, and specifically in the neural network architecture space, uh, so so-called deep learning, uh, has really accelerated massively just even in the last two to three years. Uh, lots of university research, lots of white papers, um, and accuracy just keep um, steadily creeping up. Um, and related to that, the, the platform support, so specifically the public cloud providers like so Amazon with uh, Amazon SageMaker, for example, is providing the ability to process that huge scale of data and apply these very sophisticated algorithms in a, in a much easier way. So the barriers to entry for what were essentially very specialized algorithms typically running on very specialized hardware in the past, those barriers have been blown away. And so, and then on the right hand side, what that's led to is it's now feasible to, to build predictions at a very specific level. So down to customer levels, you might have say millions of customers, but you can still make predictions as to that customer's say lifetime value, or will they churn from your platform in, in a very accurate way and, and tailored and specific down to an individual customer level rather than uh, using, if you like, statistical approaches and, and dealing with customers as cohorts of customers that you treat all as one group and give them all the same kind of strategy and treatment. You can now specialize down to an individual customer level, which uh, is a you know again game changing thing because it gives an extra level of of control over how your business operates on a kind of customer by customer basis. So to give you some ideas of scale here, um, on the uh, so so for some of our projects, for example, we're handling uh, say 30, 40 million um, documents, which we're applying natural language processing to. Um, in the insurance space, the uh, so for motor quotes, for example, um, the quote to sale ratio is really high. So due to aggregators, 
um, so like a money supermarket, those kind of guys, we're looking at quote to sale ratios of say 100 quotes for every one that's sold, every policy that's sold. So there's a huge quote volume, which contains real interesting signals and data um, and value um, that, that can be mined. So, so the volumes are huge in, in those kind of spaces as well. Okay, so that's what's changed. And, and so what, um, what can we do with this? So just, just to give a, a few quick examples. So we can now in real time, so um, as it happens, we can look for unusual financial transaction patterns in, let's say, um, withdrawals from savings accounts. Um, and we can do that at a much lower cost point than it was ever feasible before. We can run neural network models, so deep learning models, um, so a, a classic uh, application of neural network architectures. So I won't go into the technology of it too much on this, this uh, webinar, um, but we can do uh, image recognition and essentially draw out the, uh, do facial analysis. There's my colleague, Dimitros is one of our member of our data science team. Um, we can bring out uh, attributes and his sentiment from for using facial analysis techniques, uh, say underpinned by a neural network, and look at, for example, so the use case that we're interested in here is understanding customer sentiment in a retail environment to see how a customer is engaging with adverts that are being presented in store and whether that's driving them towards the right kind of purchases or whether they're just disengaged from it. So that's a, a great use case. And then another, um, another real-time use case is around uh, this is natural language processing, so NLP as it's called, and this is applying sentiment analysis in this case to a live Twitter stream to understand the impact of uh, news or say marketing activities for a specific brand to understand how their brand perception is being received uh, by customers, but in a, in a real time way. So those are the kind of things that we're doing and, and now can be done a feasible uh, a kind of price point that just wasn't possible before. So let's look at some of the opportunities that exist for organizations in a bit more depth. So it, it's, it's hard really to, to think of any public or private sector organizations or, or any areas of life, uh, life or work that are not being impacted by the application of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's every sector. So it's financial services, it's um, retail, it's medical, it's military, uh, human resources, manufacturing, and so on and so on. So these are horizontal uh, kind of use cases, horizontal considerations that would apply to almost any any sector. Uh, and like any disruptive technology, it, it can sometimes be hard for organizations to, to understand how, they can see that the trend is there, but it's hard to see the applicability to them sometimes. Um, so that's, uh, that's why we, we use this, this kind of slide. So just split into top line, so revenue generating uh, use cases, scenarios, and bottom line, so cost control and risk management type use cases. So just to pick out um, some examples from the top, so, so we've got like new revenue streams, uh, acquiring new customers more efficiently, so kind of the marketing side, um, and uh, converting more customers um, and retaining those customers, so churn management, or and, and the example we just showed around natural language processing, around understanding your brand perception in, in a kind of real-time way, even um, related to, say, uh, TV ads, for example. And on the bottom line, uh, there's things like automated compliance controls, identifying fraud, reducing fraud, two kind of quite different use cases, uh, better understanding of your commercial you know, financial risk or preventative maintenance for uh, asset rich organizations that have got physical assets. So to pick out a couple, um, couple there so at the top, um, so we're working in, uh, with, with a customer, a financial services customer on a completely new revenue stream that gives them a completely additional a new line of business, if you like, based on using their existing data, but in a kind of richer and, and deeper way. Um, we did a, an initial feasibility assessment in five days just to build some very quick predictive models uh, running on uh, Amazon SageMaker, in fact, to, to understand whether their hypothesis was valid, as in whether the business, the new business value stream would, uh, would pay back and what kind of value was hiding in there. Um, so that's one example. And then on the, um, on the, Bottom side, bottom line side, the, uh, another project we're working on is around debt collection. So optimizing how collections teams collect uh, debt or bad debt from, from um, customers in a B2C model. So optimizing the collection strategies, but not on a cohort basis, as I mentioned before, but on a per customer basis. So this particular customer is best called by the telephone on a Friday at three o'clock, because that's your best chance of, of driving, uh, driving your collections up. 
Um, so those, those are two sort of examples I just want to pull out. So then just digging into those um, couple more examples in a, just a bit more detail, there's a couple I wanted to go through. So just to bring it to life even more, if we look at customer conversion, okay? So uh, this is a kind of classic um, machine learning use case. So what we want to do is we want to uplift the conversions on a website. We want to sell more of our product on our website. So the outcome, I'm sort of focusing on the outcome first and then working backwards as to how we get there. So the outcome was recommendations about how to grow revenue and margin. So fundamentally what to do in a, in a pricing sense to increase uh, revenue without, without decrementing the margin. Um, so it's an optimization challenge. So the way that we did that was we derived a set of insights about, about customer buying behaviors and buying patterns. And uh, here's a couple of visualizations that show uh, what that really looks like. So um, if I start on the right, you can see that, so the blue dots represent customer quote opportunities that the customer didn't buy, and the red dots represent customer quote opportunities that the customer did buy. And you can see just, so what we've done here is we've taken a very complex data set and a very large data set, and we've compressed it down to two dimensions so we can visualize it, so we can plot it. And you can see immediately just by human inspection that there's there's a pattern there. there's patterns there that could be exploited by a machine learning algorithm. You couldn't programmatically code for it very easily, but a machine can learn those patterns. So on the left there, what we've got is um, is some insights around what are the attributes of a customer that actually cause them to buy or not buy your products. What are the features of a product? Sorry, the features of a customer who uh, what, that drive them to be one that buys or doesn't buy. And obviously we've anonymized this, but um, you can see which features really matter, which are the, the features that make a, make a big difference to their buying or not buying, and which features really don't matter at all. So how do we generate those insights? Um, so the way we do that is we take the raw data after our data preparation, and fundamentally we build a predictive model. And um, which I won't go into the technical gory detail of. Um, so uh, I explained a bit more actually in a, in a few slides on another example. So we build a predictive model and then from that we can use various tools and techniques to mine out from the model. So uh, essentially extract from the model what it has learned from the data. So it's a machine learning model that can make a prediction, but we're also bringing out insights um, which are the, really powerful about what it is that drives customer conversion or not customer conversion which can then be applied to the, the pricing strategies to uplift revenue. So there's an example of uh, uplifting conversions in a kind of, uh, say, a web B2C um, financial services example. So the second one I wanted to go through was on the compliance side, so specifically around anti-money laundering or detecting um, account behaviours that are may, may be indicative of money laundering. So just to set the scene, so the requirement here, so from the FCA, the regulator, uh, the FCA require that financial services organizations uh, have steps, have controls in place to identify potential money laundering activity and then to report accounts, uh, I think on a monthly basis, back about which accounts may be um, indicative of money laundering. So it's so, that, so FS organizations have to have these controls in place. The challenge is that as you get to any kind of reasonable scale, you can't do this in any kind of manual way. So, so you have to have automated controls that maybe then have some degree of human inspection for the, um, the most obvious worrying accounts, if you like. Um, so it's a, an automation challenge. Um, so how, how do we tackle this? Well, just stepping through. So the first step is getting access to the data and preparing the data and probably as a rough rule of thumb, we might spend 60% of our time and our effort actually in data preparation and sort of iterating through that. Um, and when we're improving our predictive models, we might, uh, most of the time, we're actually improving the data to feed into the, to the model rather than tuning the model itself. Um, so I won't build too much on that um, just on this webinar. Then we, uh, then we want to visualize and understand the data. So this is, so there's inherent structure in the data set. The data sets are really big, really complex, so very wide and very deep, if you like, and multi-dimensional problems. So it's, it's, it's hard, if not impossible, through human inspection to understand the, the inherent structure and 
uh, and, and its signals that are in the data set. Um, so we use a number of techniques. This is just one technique called TSNE, uh, which we use to understand what the implicit structure of the data is. Um, and then once we have understood the data set in more detail, we will then go through a, a modeling phase that will build basically algorithms, automatic algorithms using machine learning um, and make predictions. Or in this case, we're predicting, uh, we're essentially scoring, if you like, coming up with a number that, that defines what the, uh, how anomalous this savings account is in the broader context of accounts. So how unusual is it? So um, what you can see there, that's uh, in 3D to help, to help um, people to visualize the, the data because it's, you know, this is a complex data set. So what we're doing is we're compressing a, using a technique called dimensionality reduction to compress a data set down to three dimensions so we can visualize the uh, degree of difference that some savings accounts behaviors are from the norm. By, by accounts behaviors, I mean things like um, how many transactions go into the account in the month, how many come out, what value are they, where are they done, are they done online or you know, in a bricks and mortar institution. So there's a whole bunch of different dimensions that we're considering here. And you can see, uh, if you can just see, there's, a, there's one account that's a long way out from the rest. That's obviously anomalous. But the interesting ones are the, are the savings accounts that are kind of near the rest, near the normal, near the, near the rest of the accounts, near the median. Um, so those are um, potentially a bit more interesting. So once we've built, um, built and refined our predictive models, then it's not really worth anything unless we actually make recommendations and act upon it and build it into some kind of production system. Because um, that's where we actually impact the business in a positive way. So on the right hand side here, you can see there's a few specific uh, savings accounts have been highlighted uh, with a little ring. You can see that again, the one at the top right is clearly anomalous. So the organizations will typically have a, a threshold based or rules based approach already where they're, they're spotting uh, potential money laundering for, uh, for accounts where there's very obvious like large outflows or inflows like that one on the top right of that, of that graph at the bottom there. Um, but the really interesting ones are the ones that are a bit closer to the origin, um, where they, accounts may pass the existing threshold rules, which are quite kind of coarse grained and based on domain experience, um, but they are called out by, the, uh, by this approach, which is looking at the, the account behavior in multiple dimensions and looking at its deviation from the norm, uh, from normal behaviors. So, um, so what you would do is you would, use both approaches, both the threshold based approach and also this ad additively, so it's complementary um, approach of identifying um, these, these accounts that are different to the, to the normal population and those are the ones that you would feed into your, your um, fraud team or your, your customer services inspection team for deeper analysis and maybe send off to the FCA. Okay. Okay, so now I'd like to just go through some of the adoption barriers that we see for artificial intelligence. Um, so this is based on all the, the projects we've, we've run and our, our experience. And we tend to see the same patterns um, emerge in terms of some of the challenges that our customers have, uh, or, or I guess we have on our customers' behalf sometimes. So to start off with, it's really key to, 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 to understand where to start in your AI journey. Um, what we typically find with customers uh, is that there's a, there's a huge range of potential applications of artificial intelligence in their organization. Everything from NLP on chatbot logs to uh, document processing, uh, to structured uh, like conversion um, optim optimization that I've mentioned or churn analysis, you know, there's, 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 there's so many. So um, quite often we do a broad sweep with all the, uh, all the departments, if you like, of an organization to bring out all the potential opportunities. And of course, each department, each department head has their sort of favorites because that's the bit they're gold and motivated on. So um, what, what's required here is that you need some kind of prioritization scheme, some kind of selection process that allows you to whittle down where, where to start. And, and here's an example, an anonymized example from another customer. So we typically, we look at the business value and impact of, um, of a specific AI opportunity. So how impactful it will, it, will it be on the business? But we also have to consider over what time frame. So what's the sort of time to value of that? Um, so typically the more transformational AI opportunities, like a new revenue stream, take longer to, to bring to market. That's not always true. Um, so that, but the time to value is a really key consideration. And then another area that we look at is the, the feasibility 
of, of achieving that benefit. So there can be a whole range of various reasons why things are easier or harder to achieve. So they can be technical, so it could be algorithmically challenging. Um, it could be the data volumes aren't sufficient. It could be the data quality is or isn't sufficient. It could be uh, commercial barriers, like you don't own the data or you haven't got um, rights to the data. Uh, data privacy issues, although we have various anonymization strategies and techniques to deal with some of those, uh, some of those considerations. Um, and there could be political considerations, like the chairman just likes this one and that's the one that's going to get us going. So sometimes those, those factors uh, play in, it's life. So the, the key takeaway there is, is pick your battles, basically. Um, you know, be brutally focused and pick your battles and don't spread your limited resources too thinly because you'll, you'll kind of just get a kind of failure, a broad failure across the whole set rather than two real big successes that allow you to, to build upon and, and start generating some business value. So then that leads us on to, okay, how do you actually go around getting buy-in for, for your prioritized um, AI opportunities? So these things, because we're really at sort of day one for most AI and machine learning initiatives in organizations, for whatever you hear kind of in the press and in, in kind of marketing land, most organizations are relatively at day one in this area, um, and lots of them are in day zero, okay? So um, these are typically R&D projects, at least they start that way. And so that means that we find that they tend to be funded from discretionary spend, so say an innovation budget or something like that, um, and of course, that means they can be easy to kick into the long grass. So uh, we'll do it next year. We'll wait for next year's budget. We'll put it into next year's planning cycle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the challenge for me there is that the is that artificial intelligence and machine learning are, uh, I mean, obviously I'm a convert, right? And I, uh, I drink the Kool-Aid, um, but they're for me, they're an absolute given. They're like a, a must have agenda item on each um, CEO's top five at, at the moment um, and it's, it's a bit of an arms race it's a do or die scenario really for organizations um, and being late to the party is going to mean a real damaging lack of differentiation in the market with your competitors um, and there's a little snippet there from um, if I just google the definition of science as in data science so um, the key words I've highlighted there are it's about observation and experiment so these things are these are experiments we, we might have five hypotheses about um, about where AI can really benefit our business. And we might find that three of them are proven and two of them are disproven for various reasons, like let's say the data quality isn't high enough. Um, so to combat this, you have to just accept that this is a discovery process at this stage. Um, so the key takeaway is, is, is discover first and invest later. So make sure that you're not betting the house like on one big thing um, and having some, but have small measured investments that allow you to get far enough to prove the value and then and then press the trigger and look for more funding and invest later and that will help the the kind of funding discussion and cycle so that leads nicely on to the next point which is you need to, once once you then are executing on on your ai opportunity then you need a delivery process and and a, and a data science method to to deliver inside that process so here's a quick graphic of our delivery process so this is our um, like we're doing an initial engagement with a customer, we call this discovery as a service. And you can see it's, it's broken down into like a first week where we're, we're really nailing down what we call the exam question. So it's the hypothesis to be tested. And at the end of that first week, we, we're looking to write down only on a couple of sheets of paper, if you like. So that level of detail, a terms of reference, which we call target opportunity definition. So what is the hypothesis to be tested? So we think we can uplift customer conversions by Y percent using this data set using this algorithm and we're going to do it in these four weeks and we need these dependencies to achieve it these domain experts to call upon da, 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 and so on you, you think that every, everybody generally thinks they have the same understanding of the exam question until you then as always write it down and then play it back and then there's some nuts some nuances and subtleties come out that's a really valuable part of the process then we embark on three one weekly iterations uh, one of the things we always find after that kind of week two is that there's there's some kind of surprises in the data that come out that our customer didn't know about and you know there's subtleties so you just don't know what you don't know until um, until, until you get going so you need to have a process that can can twist and turn and and, and deal with those kind of surprises so um, 
this process, the data science process that we follow is, is broadly derived from something called CRISP-DM. Um, which you, if you've not heard of it, there's a graphic on the right hand side. There. It's quite long in the tooth, so it's been around a long time. Its uh, derivation is from the world of um, data mining, which is not a term you tend to hear that much now in AI circles, um, but it's still a completely valid process. There's a URL there if you want to. Um, so if you're setting up your own process, I'd thoroughly recommend you look at it. Um, and, uh, and we've essentially taken that process and tweaked it for our own purposes to, to ensure that we have frequent, uh, frequent time box delivery iterations and, and minimize the initial upfront cost and, and have a way to deliver and collaborate with our customers. So, um, so the key takeaways there is, is, I think you should be brutal on scope um, and really define what success looks like. So a few, like five top critical success factors at the end of that week one, everybody signs up on it and off we go. Have an iterative approach, so iterate, but with a defined end, so time boxed. Uh, so one week isn't enough to explore these typically, these hypotheses in enough depth, and um, and 20 weeks is too long because you kind of, it, it's dragging on. You need to get, it'd be punchy and do it in, let's say three weeks is what we find. And then the last point I wanted to make is, um, is that have a platform. So you don't want to have any barriers in the way of your data science activities. Um, so we have a platform called Ramp, uh, the Rapid Analytics and Machine Learning Platform, which is underpinned by Amazon Web Services. And this allows us just to move really quick, basically. That's the, the point, is not to have any barriers in, and we're focusing on the business problem, not the not kind of the heavy lifting and engineering. So we need to, just walking, working from the bottom of the stack up, we need to ingest lots of data of lots of different types, so structured, unstructured, streaming data, batch data, relational databases, and so on. So we need to ingest those into a data lake model and in a, in a secure way. We then need to apply a whole bunch of services to those, so natural language processing or neural networks or um, standard um, predictive um, sort of scikit learn type models, for example. It's a whole range of services that we need and tools we need to apply. And then at the top layer, we need to then visualize those um, in lots of different ways and ultimately build them into operational production systems, uh, whether it's streaming data or batch data. And then around that, we need to have all the standard enterprise security uh, automated deployments, a high availability, and, and and so on, that you'd expect. So that the key takeaways there that I wanted to stress were that um, enterprise grade data security is a day one requirement for these projects because you're handling production data from day one. There's no point performing machine learning on a test data set. Right? You've got to be building AI against your production data set, which typically means it's got quite high security considerations. So it's, a, it's not this is not test and error. This is using production data even from day one of the data science work. Uh, so you need a platform that doesn't stop you from doing that, you know, enables that. Second point is absolutely leverage public cloud services to accelerate and for cost efficiency. So uh, you, the days of setting up your own, you know, waiting months to set up your own tin and, and infrastructure and then kind of installing the services yourselves when they're already quite commodity it, are gone. So absolutely leverage those for speed and cost. And the last point is just be ready for production rollout. We're doing this because we want to expose services um, for, into our production systems, like make predictions from our website, for example. So you need a, an endpoint, you want to deploy your model to an endpoint, like a, an Amazon SageMaker endpoint, for example, so you can do that at scale quickly um, and not get bogged down by the heavy lifting. So just to um, wrap up, uh, just sort of five key points to, to summarize really. The first is I think we live in an absolutely transformational time and there's transformational opportunities. So AI is impacting all work and all, all home life, voice assistance at home, the, everything you can imagine. So it's, um, it's an amazing time, but it gives organizations huge opportunities. And so the things I, I feel organizations need to do is one, prioritize their opportunities um, using the kind of approach that I've described. Budget for experiments, but then when those experiments are proven, then move into budgeting for bigger implementation projects have some rigor in the approach that's really required so have a process and a data science method um, for running those experiments and then those projects and uh, and remove all the barriers really around um, around speed and scale so have make sure the data security is there from day one uh, and that all the tooling is available and there's no barriers and, and enable that through a platform so those are the those are the key points Okay, that's all I wanted to go through. I just wanted to see if uh, we've got any time for any questions. Um, probably got time for one. Um, just see what's come in. Okay, so one one question I've um, 
we've been asked is uh, so does does the um, does the discovery process, the, the discovery as a service process that I talked about, does it sometimes take longer than four weeks? Um, and, and the answer to that is, is sometimes, yes, it does. So sometimes there's dependencies, a classic one being you get one week into the machine learning, the modeling, the, the AI modeling phase, and we find some deficiencies with the data set that requires, let's say, a re-extraction of a fresh data set. And so there's a dependency maybe on a third party. So maybe the customer has outsourced um, some kind of outsourced IT arrangement and we're in a in a queue waiting for data to be to be generated for us or to be extracted for us. And that's just life. So we aim for four weeks and then we accept that we have to roll with the punches, right? Um, uh, but I think shoot uh, shoot for the four weeks is, uh, is my advice as a starting point. Okay, so I think we're just about out of time there. So just to um, summarize, you can see uh, there's some contact details on the screen there. So if you need to contact us, then uh, my colleague Zoe's details are there. There's a few links to case studies on our website, so public case studies I've alluded to. Um, you can see our um, Twitter and um, LinkedIn, and you can follow us on those. So thank you very much for attending, and uh, have a good weekend.